All right, I'm Sarah Vaya. Um, I'm a professor at University of Maryland, uh, for those of you who don't know me already. And this is the first of a series of five webinars this summer. And I decided to start out by um, talking about what uh, uh, a really good post-fossil fuel world might look like. Okay, so I am um, going to discuss how we are going to get to this good world. In other words, how are we going to avoid all of the problems that are coming with climate change? How are we going to get to that world? What's it going to look like? And I will say I've been doing a lot of reading and a lot of reading over the last year. And four books have really um, helped me out a lot. Um, the Future We Choose by Christiana Figueres and her sidekick at the Paris Climate um, Negotiations, Tom Rivet Karnak, Climate Courage by Andreas Karelas, Electrify by Saul Griffith, which is a great book, Saving Us by Catherine Hayhoe. And I'll refer to a few other books later, but a lot of the ideas um, that I'll be discussing today have been distilled from these sources. Okay. Um, what I want to do is start out by just restating the obvious. <laughs> obvious. We have a big climate problem. Um, it is no surprise to anyone that the climate impacts are increasing. This is a picture from last year when we had the big heat wave in the West, but we're having a giant heat wave across the Midwest moving East now. Um, um, we are having increasing numbers of in, uh, inland floods that are serious increasing drought, more fire. Fire season has already started out in the West and it, things would be burning out there from now probably till the late fall. Hurricanes are becoming more frequent, more intense. Um, uh, this is a derecho, um, a really damaging storm, but we are getting more and more of these all the time. We all know we are not cutting greenhouse gas emissions fast enough. The IPCC reports, I've sent out information about that in some of my newsletters. They are painting an ever grimmer picture. And when you read the, the papers um, or you look at the media, and, and I'm talking about responsible, good media where you know that they are um, telling the truth. There's an overrepresentation of disaster stories because people are drawn to that. They'll read that. That is, you know, that sort of uh, um, gets more people to the to the paper or to the to the uh, TV channel or whatever. Um, and uh, it seems like with not just climate change but every other problem we currently have, which is a long list, as you know that it's just sometimes a little bit too much to take. And um, so <laughs> I'll just ask you, hey, do you feel overwhelmed and exhausted yet? Because I'm telling you, I do. And um, over the winter, I just felt like I have got to get a better grip on this because I really can't stand um, just dwelling in the problems. Um, and I think there's something very important in this issue of the media over representing the disaster stories. It turns out, it's like, whoa, wait a minute, that solutions and very great examples of climate action that is occurring do not get very much coverage, but there's a lot of progress everywhere, okay? And I just got this book two days ago and I opened it up and um, it, it really, you know, it crystallized what I already knew um, uh, this woman's a, a, a PhD and she's, she runs through all the scientific, sort of many scientific studies about how this is true. Visualizing a positive future and believing it will happen is actually the first step towards making it happen. She talks about, and this is familiar to all of us, she talks about the placebo effect. People who take pills that they think are going to work actually <laughs> recover better than people who who um, um, don't take any pills. So they actually didn't take any medicine, but they recover as if they had. And she makes a very strong case, I haven't completely digested it yet, that we really need to get our minds out of the gloom and doom because you know it's horrible for one thing and it's depressing and it's very hard to keep going forward. Um, but it turns out it's not just depressing, it's counterproductive. And so 
Um, that's what this webinar is about. It's like, let's think about what we can create together, how we can get past this climate crisis in some way that doesn't just leave us with a bunch of shards of awful ecosystems. And what do we need to do to make this happen? And, um, and then basically, let's get working on it. So are you ready to get going on this? Um, I want to assure you that this is not a fringe issue, okay? 72% of Americans accept that climate change is real. And this is a map from the Yale climate, uh, um, the climate change opinion maps. When they ask people, this is um, in 2021, is climate change occurring? You'll notice here's the scale. Anything that um, isn't white or blue is above 50% in every single state. This is even all the states. Um, a majority of people accept that climate change is real. That doesn't mean they all want to do something about it, but they accept that climate change is real. Um, this is the most recent incarnation of the Yale and George Mason um, Global Warming Six America study. And in 2021, they found that 57% of Americans are on this end of the scale. That's the most alarmed and concerned about climate change. These are the folks that with the sort of highest degree of acceptance of global warming. They're the most motivated to do something about this. I would suspect that pretty much everyone in this webinar is in one of these two groups. These groups want climate action, okay? And these are people just like you. They're not nutcases. They're people just like us. And, you know, in the big diversity of things, probably more diverse than us, but um, uh, uh, this is a central issue. Now, what do we have to do to stop climate change, to rein this thing in? Well, again, stating the obvious, we have to stop greenhouse gas emissions, which means we have to stop burning fossil fuels for power and transportation. Fossil fuels are um, it, very cool, actually. Remains of previously living creatures that have been compressed way under the earth, and they're almost like pure carbon. And they've been down there for millions of years. We bring them up and burn them. There goes that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in a huge, big dose. And that's what's causing us so much trouble. Stop burning fossil fuels for power and transportation. And methane emissions from natural gas. I've written about this in the newsletter. For those of you who get that, uh, there was a lot of information in there about methane um, emissions being much higher than we thought. Landfills are also releasing more methane than we thought. Animal agriculture, of course, is a big source of methane. And we need to control nitrous oxide. Um, nitrous oxide and methane are the two big greenhouse gases other than carbon dioxide. We need to control nitrous oxide by limiting the use of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. This is a big part of our um, greenhouse gas profile and nitrous oxide is 300 and some 380 or something times more potent a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Methane is about 20 times. Um, but we also need to work on the natural world. We need to restore ecosystems. Um, and <clears throat> the trend in discussion appears to be that we need to reforest and rewild up to 50% of the planet, okay? That's gonna be a very different looking world than the world we have now. And we will be doing this using land that was formerly used to grow animal feed, old highways, parking lots, lawn, you know, you name it. Um, because things are going to be pretty different in the future. So these, these are our marching orders, stop greenhouse gas emissions and restore ecosystems. Um, is this going to be easy? Of course it isn't. <laughs> of course it isn't. Um, the good news is more and more of us are recognizing the problem, but we know there are going to be many, many setbacks and delays. But I am confident that as we move through the 2020s, people in the world want to have a good future for their kids, for their grandkids. People want to fix this. They will be feeling the pinch, the increasing impacts, both the physical, you know, the weather, et cetera, and economic impacts. I'll talk about this next time. This is really important because a lot of people have um, 
subscribe to the opinion that it is too expensive to fix. It's, it's way too expensive not to fix. I'll talk about this next time. I think that as we move uh, through the next 10, 15 years, action is going to accelerate. And um, I'm pretty sure I can count on most of you to be a part of that. The thing I'd like you to know, and I don't have enough time to give as many examples as I want, but people all over the country are already working really hard on this. If you read this book, Climate Courage, um, about half of it is examples of municipalities and states where really important climate action is being taken. And this is published in 2020. There are many more examples now. So there's a lot of progress being made already particularly at state and local levels. And I'm not going to be able to review all that, but um, uh, well, there's just a lot out there. I invite you to look for what's going on in your neighborhood. Okay, so let's take a look, try to get an outline of what this great future could look like. First of all, everything's gonna run on abundant clean electricity. We're not gonna be generating power by burning coal and gas anymore. This will dramatically improve our health. And I'll talk to you about that later. And it will increase equity and improve climate justice. And I'll talk to you about that too. The air and the water are going to be a lot cleaner because we will no longer be emitting the toxic fumes or the water pollution that right now is gushing into the air and water by the minute from our power plants and cars. I don't know if many of you noticed at the beginning of the pandemic when people, I live in the DC area as you all know, but um, in Maryland, when people weren't driving to work, people started to telecommute. All of a sudden I noticed the air really looked good, okay? and. That is nothing compared to the way it will look when we stop this stuff. More and more of us will be living in cities and these cities are gonna be different. They're gonna be greener. They're gonna be filled with plants and parks and pedestrian spaces and small scale agriculture. This is a community garden. Um, so that's the beginning. Um, the regenerating biodiversity part, as I said, 50% of the earth will need to be covered in trees and natural ecosystems. And this is a big job, but you know we're, we're already moving in that direction. Much more agriculture will be small, local, and what they call regenerative, which means taking care of the soil, taking care of, of, um, of, of diversity. This is a, uh, a very uh, biodiverse, regenerative, form of agriculture. Here's a, I love this prairie strip where native plants are planted in between big fields of corn. This is a good step. Um, native plants in people's gardens, again, more community gardens, lots more trees, lots more native grasslands. We've just got to pick up the pace on this. Now, I'm really, I have to move through this kind of quickly. What are some pivotal steps towards this positive future? I'm going to focus on the first two today electrify our vehicles and all the appliances we use when they need replacing and switch to clean renewable energy. So I've been very inspired by Saul Griffith's book and his thoughts. Um, his book's called Electrify. Uh, I heard a fantastic webinar with him and Bill McKibben, which you can look up online and, and, and watch. And I, I've told many people this, I almost never watch webinars because they're so boring which is one reason I try not to be boring when I'm giving a webinar. Um, and um, this nonprofit called Rewiring America um, uh, was uh, founded in part by Saul Griffith and he doesn't work there now, but um, they have picked up the baton and there are tremendous numbers of resources there. So electrify, switch to clean renewable energy. Um, other steps that I'm not gonna talk about today, develop and boost distributed, distributed regenerative agriculture, including shifting to the plant-based diet and slashing food waste. I discussed both of these in detail last year in webinars, and you can find the videos of these on my website. Rebuild biodiversity everywhere from yards to national parks. I talked about this last year in a webinar as well. And finally, green the cities as I um, uh, introduced. And we need to build fast and convenient mass, mass transit. We don't need to all be driving our individual cars, even if they are EVs. Um, and we need to have more public green spaces. So sort of moving away from everyone driving around in their cars, all this a territory covered with asphalt and highways and doing much more convenient, 
fast mass transit that takes up much less space. Okay, so this is what we need to do, at least these five things. Um, I wanna talk about electrify everything because I got very excited about this last November when I heard Saul Griffith give this webinar about it. And I've been learning as much as I can since then. There's two parts to decarbonizing the economy, which is, means getting off of fossil fuels. Electrify our vehicles and household appliances. Replace the dirty electrical power with clean renewable power. So I sort of restating what I just said. We need to do both of those things to effectively reduce emissions. And this is a figure from, um, uh, I didn't put the link on here, but uh, there are other links to the um, um, uh, um, report on the Rewiring America website where this is found. Um, this is emissions in millions of metric tons in different years. Um, this blue goes with this line. If we do the clean grid, that means clean power, wind and solar, hydro, nuclear, um, then we can reduce emissions as we need to and really get down low, low, low by 2050. But if we don't electrify our machines at home and our cars, then we're going to have these machines, because they last a long time, still running on fossil fuels, Still, you'll still be people still be going to the gas station. They'll still be, you know, buying natural gas for their homes and stuff. Though we'll still have emissions from fossil fuels way out here. So to get this down, we need to do both of these things. Okay. Um, all right. So um, this information is from reports on the website Rewiring America. This is the, from the Electrify Home Guide, and I sent this around, I think, on the newsletter a few months ago, just to review. Um, households in the U.S. use 42% of U.S. energy, and this is not just heating the houses, but all the decisions we make. Saul Griffith has come up with um, this um, figure, 1 billion, and <laughs> trust me, I'm pretty sure he, he knows. <laughs> He's a really quantitative guy. 1 billion vehicles and household machines burn gas or oil or use outmoded electrical resistance for like electrical resistance um, furnaces. And here's a pictures. He's quite an artist too. Here's some pictures of um, these outmoded appliances and vehicles. Most of these last 10 to 20 years. And so here's a key thing. Next time one of these appliances or your vehicle needs to be replaced, just say to yourself, I'm going to replace it with an electric, okay? You don't have to do this all at once, okay? Because these things poop out in different rates. Do it as fast as you can. And I'll talk about how these things can be financed in, in the webinar uh, next time on July 6th. So choose electric, choose an electric vehicle, a heat pump um, instead of a gas or electric furnace, an induction cooktop, an electric dryer, electric water heater. If you know, next year you decide I need a new furnace, I'm going to buy a gas furnace. That is prolonging the fossil fuel era by another 10 or 15 years. So this is kind of a key thing. We don't have to replace these things all that often, but when we do shift over to electric, okay? I'm not telling you to go home and ditch all your appliances <laughs> next week because that would not, well, that would be a little bit hard to swallow. Okay, now, I want to talk about a few important reasons that we've got to ditch fossil fuels besides just the greenhouse gas emissions. Fossil fuels are not only dirty, they're really inefficient energy sources. So in, uh, electricity generation we do by coal or natural gas, very little oil anymore. In addition to carbon dioxide emissions, let's look at coal. Here's a coal fire power plant in Maryland, at least 85 toxic chemicals and PM 2.5 is particulate matter that's smaller than 2.5 microns. That means way smaller than the thickness of a human hair. This stuff is very dangerous. This comes out of forest fires also. And the toxic chemicals are absorbed onto these little particles. You breathe them in, they go right into your bloodstream. Very, very dangerous. So this is coming out of the smokestacks. Um, natural gas, methane is emitted during fracking and um, um, transport in pipelines and during storage. And again, I showed you some pictures of that in a newsletter not too long ago. But here's the thing that most of us don't know. If we generate electricity in a coal fired power plant, 67% of the energy in the coal is lost 
wasted as heat, goes right up the smokestack, smokestacks as heat. Only 33% of the energy in the coal makes it to our power outlets, okay? This is a gigantic waste, right? Let's talk about natural gas, it's a little bit better. There are several different kinds of natural gas power plants. Only, so quote, only 40 to 58% of the energy in the natural gas is lost as heat. Um, and the low value is for natural gas combined cycle where they use the heated water and, and, and um, the, I'm going to not get this right, but they, they are able to generate more electricity from the, some of this heat that would have been lost. So in this 40 to 60 percent of it makes it to your outlets, but still, you know, losing 40 percent, this stuff is expensive, right? And this 40% is just wasted, right? So most of the energy in coal and natural gas is lost as heat in generating plants. So that's one reason we don't wanna do it besides them being dirty. Now let's talk about cars. Transportation using fossil fuels is very inefficient. I just learned this recently and I thought it was such a shocker <laughs> that I really wanted to share this with you. You put gas in your car. And you know you pump in a bunch of gallons of gas, and it has energy in it because it is the remains. This is so cool. It is the sort of almost not fossilized, but pressurized remains of um, little sea creatures. Okay, the carbon in them becomes goes into the into the petroleum. Seventy to eighty percent, eighty-eight percent of this as lost as heat. You touch your engine, it's hot. You look, you feel the exhaust, it's hot. All this heat you're paying for, right? It's coming from this gasoline. 12 to 30% of it is moving your vehicle down the road. That is really wasteful. Let's put this into perspective. When gas is 465 a gallon, I mean, I think it was last week, it's probably more now. That means at least $3.22 of every gallon, you might as well just go over to the sewer and drop it in, right? You're not getting anything from that except a bunch of tailpipe pollution, et cetera. All electric saves money because once you've got the electricity, you don't have to convert it again. It's it, the energy is lost when we change from one form of energy to another, from chemical energy in the gas um, to mechanical energy in the car. That wastes power and money. EVs cost between three and four cents a mile to drive versus a gas vehicle per mile costs 14 to 20 cents. Okay. And with EVs, electric vehicles, there's no more air or water pollution right? Because we're not using those fossil fuels. So this is a good thing. I want you to remember when you're filling up that <laughs> almost, you know, up to 88% of what you're paying for is basically being wasted, which it, well, that's really maddening. Okay. Electric vehicles. Let's talk about those for a minute. They address the nation's number one cause of greenhouse gas emissions, which is now transportation. They will provide big health benefits by reducing air pollution. I'll talk about that more later. The purchase prices are getting pretty close to gas vehicles. Um, I looked this up online. Um, this is a Chevy uh, Bolt. It's about $32,000 before the $7,500 tax credit. And if you don't want to subtract in your mind, it means that after the tax credit, it's about $24,500. Not bad. It's a great little car. This is a Ford Lightning, their new electric F-150. Um, the fleet versions, the fleet models are as low as $39,000 and they, you know, for people who want to pay for all the bells and whistles, you, you know, like they already do with their Ford, you know, F-150 top of the line, um, it goes up to $97,000, but they're hoping to sell a lot of these trucks to fleets because they have a lot of features that people can plug in their equipment, their tools and stuff in the back, in the front, you know, this, there's no engine under here, right? They call this the frunk. Anyway, these are within striking distance, you know, in, in as reasonable prices for vehicles. The operating expenses is much, are much lower. Okay, remember what I just said about how much of each gallon of gas is wasted and, um, you know, a couple of cents per mile versus 14 to 20 cents. Now, people worry a lot about the lithium batteries, and I'm happy to report there's a lot of work being done on this. Um, uh, I read an article you know, not too long ago in a reputable source of um, it, it's a lot of smart people out there who are trying to invent stuff, you know, and, and this article was about extracting lithium from water. Okay, I don't know how they do that. But what's really happening already is that 
people have very good ideas about how to recycle lithium batteries. And in fact, and get the lithium out um, and without you know, wasting it and then using it in new batteries. So that is what we need, the circular economy. I use you know, lithium in some electric vehicle I buy. And then when that is dead, um, they take out that battery, they recycle it, they put that lithium in another vehicle. That's what we need. And um, you know, people who worry about, I don't wanna be in somewhere when my battery goes dead, the nationwide charging system is expanding. Ford is really working on this and other, you know, Tesla has their own nationwide system. Ford has a system where you get a little app and it tells you, okay, you, you can go plug in your truck or your, your other electric vehicle from Ford over here. Um, this is really important infrastructure. Okay, electric vehicles. Even when the power source is dirty, that is even you know, before we get clean electricity, electric vehicles are cheaper and cleaner than gas vehicles, even where the power source is dirty. This is from Union of Concerned Scientists in 2020. They, uh, these are different power regions. They identified only two power regions where it's sort of borderline as to whether the EVs are cheaper or not. Everywhere else, these are um, sort of uh, equivalent miles per gallon. So in Texas, an EV, EV gives you 68 effective miles per gallon, okay? Um, uh, 85 in this region, 56 in this region. Here's another, um, this is from Yale Climate Connections. This was just recently published. Uh, electric vehicles, vehicles are substantially cheaper to operate than gasoline powered cars. Here's the price of gas in different places. Here's the Maryland, this was um, in June 22, this month. Um, Maryland, price of gas 460, filling up, filling up the battery in an electric vehicle would cost you the equivalent of $1.43 per gallon. That sounds really great to me, okay? I really like that. And, um, and that price is going to remain relatively stable and I'll show you information about that in a few minutes. Um, okay, now that's electrifying our vehicles and our appliances. When we add in clean power, that is when we clean up that grid we are super efficient. Why is that? There is no more conversion loss. We generate electricity in the turbines and in the uh, panels, solar panels, generate the electrons in there, and then they come flowing down the line, wherever it is, into your VW micro bus. This is a prototype model, which I, I think is so hilarious. It's like back to the future, right? Um, no conversion loss. The electricity is generated, it goes in the vehicle, it moves the car. There is no changing from one form to the other. Plus, big bonus, there's no more carbon dioxide, no more methane, no more air and water pollution from mining, transporting, storing, and burning the fossil fuels. This is like a really, really great picture. I am so happy when I think about this. And I... Um, I'll tell you for the last week, I've been working on this webinar really intensively <laughs> and I have been finding so much information, so much progress. I can't summarize it all. I can barely keep it all in my head. And um, I'll just assure you that there is a lot happening out there that is uh, pushing the ball forward here and, and, and is heading us towards this, um, towards this future. Um, big, big bonus. Saul Griffith writes in Electrify, and he has a big calculation about this, but um, I think you can understand from how much energy is wasted in electricity and cars. When we have everything electrified and a clean power grid, America's energy needs will be cut in half. Whoa, we will need half as much energy as we use now. Here's a, a wonderful graphic from Rewiring America. All the American dream, half the energy, none of the emissions. It's like, I like this world. This is the world I wanna live in, right? Where, where we have enough power, the energy becomes abundant, clean and cheap. We're not you know, scrambling for every kilowatt hour because we have reduced the amount we need. Um, I have, I'll just give a little aside. I have solar panels on my house, which I, I put up there in 2008. And when I had the you know, guy come over from the solar uh, company, I said, okay, well, how big of a system do I need? He says, the first thing you should do is figure out how you can make your um, uh, house a little more efficient. So you don't need to replace as much power. It's like, dang, if you don't need that power, you don't have to replace it. 
the fact that when we're electrified, we only need half the power makes this vision, wind and solar, a lot more realistic. It's so exciting to me. So every household in the US will benefit and I'll, I'll give you a few little financial numbers and in, in later on in the talk. Okay, this is important these days with um, all of the strife going on in Ukraine and Europe um, and all of the past strife we have gone through to acquire and protect fossil fuels in these far off countries. Once we have electrification and a clean grid, we will be energy independent. We will not need oil and gas from Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Russia. We will not have to send our forces over there to mess around and protect these energy sources. We will not have to deal with non-democratic governments. Bill McKibben wrote a wonderful article in The New Yorker where he basically calls it heat pumps for peace and freedom. When we are electrified, we can just say, we don't need your fossil fuels. So long. Okay, homegrown energy made in the USA. I like that. And this is a, a, a nice um, graphic from Rewiring America. I wanted to show you this. Electrification and a clean grid will protect you from the kinds of price increases we are struggling with right now. Um, it, here's the um, link to um, the report, or actually, I think it was a, a um, well, it's sort of a report on, uh, on um, rewiring America. This is, oh, sorry, I cut this off, seasonally adjusted price increase and starting in March, 2021. And it, you know, the prices of the fossil fuels have just been rocketing upwards. Natural gas in the light orange, gasoline in the dark orange and fuel oil in the darkest orange. Whoa, here we are in March, 2022. This is why everyone is struggling and going out of their minds, trying to fill up their cars and heat their homes and whatnot. Here is the change in price of electricity, way smaller, way smaller. So if you are electrified from a clean grid, we are protected from this, okay? And that is not only really important, but it's, I find very, very comforting. Okay, now, I want to put this in a little, little tiny bit out of place, but I mentioned that the solar installer guy suggested that I make my house a little more energy efficient. And this is really, you know, useful. However, energy efficiency alone will not solve our problems. Um, and this is a, a, a cute little graphic again from Rewiring America, and I appreciate them sharing this with me. Um, the efficient appliances powered with fossil fuels still have the waste and emission problems. So if we, here's what we're using now, here's how much is wasted. If we make our machines and vehicles more efficient, okay, we're using a little less, but there's still a boatload that's wasted. If we have clean electrification, a little tiny bit is wasted, but we are not using nearly as much, okay? So this is their tagline, electrification is the efficiency. The way to be really efficient is to switch over to highly efficient electric appliances and, um, and cars. Um, and uh, you know, this is, this is a good interim step, but this is where we really wanna go. Okay, now I know everyone's been really eager to start learning about heat pumps. <laughs> I have to tell you that I'm going to tell you about heat pumps because I didn't really get how they worked and I'm so excited I finally get it. So here's what we're here's what I'm going to tell you. I, we, it all starts out with two basic true facts of physics. Two things. If you expand a gas, it gets cooler. If you compress a gas, it gets hotter. That's like true fact, basic true fact in physics. So this is how heat pumps gather heat from the outside or dump heat off in the outside. So in the winter, let's talk about that. Heat pumps, here's the house. Heat pumps have two parts. They have an inside part called the air handler, which you know most people would recognize as a furnace, but it really isn't, it's just moving air around. And it has an outside part where there's a compressor and an expansion valve, okay? So we have outside is where the expansion and compression of the gas happens. So in winter, here we are. It, uh, air in the house is cool, goes in here, goes, well, 
goes in here, comes out, goes over here, goes outside, okay? And it gets to the expansion valve. Now this air is pretty cold because it's been your house, okay? It's probably warmer than outside, but still it's pretty cold. The expansion valve allows us to expand and it cools way off, okay? So that it's colder than the outside air, okay? That sounds improbable because these things can go down to minus 15 degrees F. But that's the miracle of expanding the gas. Colder than the outside air. So this cold refrigerant absorbs heat from the outside, even when it's cold out there. And then it goes to the compressor and the compressor um, presses it down and makes it hot. And then it goes into your house, dumps off the warm air, comes back cool air. Okay, that's the whole thing. We take this refrigerant, which is, you know, uh, has special properties um, and uh, allow it to expand, cool off, and then compress it, heat it up. Now, in the summer, opposite. So this is what I just said. Direction of flow is reversed, okay? Instead of um, it going out to the expansion valve from the house, it goes to the compressor. So the air is warmer in the house. Um, uh, they um, compress it. It gets even warmer than the outside air. So it dumps that extra heat off to the outside air. It's the difference in temperature that makes this thing work. So you couldn't just pump your inside air, uh, 70, you know, whatever it is, 70 degree air outside and have anything happen. No, you have got to make that much warmer so that it gets really, really hot. So that when the outside air comes in, runs over that really hot stuff, the refrigerant dumps that heat into the outside air, comes back, it's cooler, but it goes through the ex expansion valve, Whoosh, opens up, cools down, sends this cool air into the house and cools you off. I'm sorry, I think that is one of the cleverest things ever. So I just had to share that with you. Um, Heat pumps are super efficient because they don't generate heat. You don't have to burn anything to generate a bunch of heat. They just transfer it. They use the miracle of expansion and compression to transfer heat to the outside where you know it just can go out and be out there. So a lot of people have very bad things to say about heat pumps. And um, I'll just, I, I need to make a point about this. We aren't in the 1970s and 1980s anymore. When I was in college, we're talking a long time ago, okay? Um, I was a freshman in college in 1969. Um, I went home to visit my parents. They had moved from Connecticut to North Carolina. They had a heat pump. They complained about this heat pump all the time. The air coming out is so cold, we can never get warm. Okay, now, older heat pumps of that vintage were not that great, okay? They could only transfer heat when the temperatures were greater than 32 degrees. When the temperatures got colder than that, what happened was there's a great big like space heater in there, the auxiliary heat, the dreaded auxiliary heat that kicks in. It's super inefficient. It's like trying to heat your, heat your house with a space heater. Okay, so it costs a lot and it really isn't that satisfying. We are not in that world anymore. Now heat pumps like this fancy one or this somewhat less fancy one um, can work. That means transfer their heat as low as 15 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter, okay? That means, um, actually I want like this, that you can turn off that auxiliary heat so it never comes on, okay? Now it can come on and make you more comfortable to change the temperature more rapidly, but I say, I don't need that. I just leave that thing turned off. It only comes on to defrost the coils out here when it's freezingly cold. Um, and this saves a basket of money. Um, we also have improved variable speed compressors. It doesn't just go on or off, it's variable speed. And in the summer, in fact, I think right now in my house, the variable speed compressor is on and it's dehumidifying the air. This is a mistake before the compressor comes on. Um, uh, it's dehumidifying the air before it has to go to the extra step of, um, of uh, 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 spending any more energy on it. I, I didn't say that very well because I don't think I understand it completely, but this is what happens. It dehumidifies at a very low expense. Okay, the next innovation to embrace, induction cooktops, and you guys are going, what are those? Nobody knows what induction cooktops are. So let's review. In a newsletter, I sent out this article about um, a study done in California where they measured how much methane and other air pollutants are coming out of the gas cooktops, um, just leaking out, even when the darn things aren't on, even when they don't have a pilot light running. 
So gas cooktops pollute your house. The old electric cooktops, this is the old style. This is a semi-old style. This is where you have actual coils. These are resistance and they pass electricity through there and they heat up, okay? This is just the coils are under glass so it looks a little cleaner, okay? But the old electric cook, cooktops heat up the coils. Then that heat from the coil heats the pan. But actually I just read today, 68% of that heat Actually, it doesn't even go into the pan. It just goes into your kitchen. Who needs that, right? Another big waste. Induction cooktops are completely different. They transfer the electric current directly to the pan. This is what one looks like. It's funny. They, um, because the burners, so-called burners, they're not really burners anymore. They don't get hot. People don't know, don't remember that they're on. And so they had to... Um, Put these extra little lights on here to show you that the thing is on because if you touch it it won't be hot okay so nobody wants to leave their thing on all night and waste a bunch of power so they put these on which i think is kind of interesting the way this works is there the, there's an electromagnetic field below the so-called burner below here and it heats up the pan okay directly no heating of the air or nothing. It heats up the pan. You have to have a pan that will, will, is, will respond to an electromagnetic field. And you know that if a magnet will stick to it. So you have to have, you do have to have a pan, cast iron or stainless steel. Um, this cooks the food very, very much faster. And it's a lot more responsive to change because you don't have to wait for these coils to heat up and go down. It, it, it's pretty much instantaneous. And even some big time chefs, I don't keep track of the big time chef circuit, but even some big time chefs are adopting induction cooktops because it has a similar feel to a gas stovetop where you can control the heat very you know, uh, sensitively. The top never gets hot and you've got to have a special pan. Now there aren't induction ovens. Electric ovens still use resistance. But the cool thing is, if you get a convection oven, which has a fan in there that circulates the air, that speeds up your cooking. You can cook everything 25 degrees lower than the nominal temperature, and it uses 20% less energy because it circulates that warm air instead of just leaving it in there. When you circulate the air, that heats up your item in the oven faster than if you just let it sit there. So um, even though you have to still buy an electric oven, okay, um, get rid of your gas oven if you have a gas oven. Um, we still have to use resistant electric, but buy a, buy a convection oven. Okay, laundry. Gas dryers pollute your house pretty much in some of the same ways as the gas cooktops. Um, so here's a front loading high efficiency washer and a heat pump dryer. Um, uh, I wanted to mention something about these front loading washers. I have one, not, not this model, but I have one like this. And um, it's already electric, right? So I'm not electrifying anything different. But what this thing does, it, it, nobody ever mentions it. It's a life changer. This thing spins the clothes so fast. It sounds like a jet is taking off in my laundry room. And the clothes come out of there all, three quarters of the way dry compared to a top loading, you know, regular washing machine. Um, and that is, you know, that is going to save you a lot of power. It speeds up the drying, et cetera. Dry electric, especially Energy Star dryers have heat sensors. So they turn off when dry. A lot of people, you know, just say, I'm going to drive for 60 minutes. Well, if it's dry in 30 minutes, you're still paying for that extra power. Heat pump dryers are also available. They work on the same principle as the heat pump furnaces. But I'll ask you, if you have the ability to, well, everybody can put one of these up in their basement, but if you have a place to hang a clothesline, why not try solar clothes drying with a clothesline? Um, I've said this to many people before, which everyone finds to be pretty funny, but um, legislation was passed in Maryland, I don't remember what year, uh, to make Maryland a, quote, right to dry state. That is, your HOA cannot tell you you can't dry your clothes in the backyard. They might say you got to dry them under the deck, but they cannot forbid you from drying your clothes outside. So, hey, give it a try. Um, I do it and it works great. Okay. Now let's talk about clean renewable energy. We need to move to generating all electricity with clean renewables. And this is some good news here. Just since 2009, 2009 to 2021 on both graphs, the price of wind per megawatt hour has plummeted, but not as much as the price of solar, okay? So what used to cost um, for a megawatt hour 
almost $400 back in 2009, cost $40 now. This is exactly what we need. So um, this comes from a report that comes out every year from this organization called lezard.com. They calculate the levelized cost of um, electricity. And by levelized, they mean they put all the forms of electricity on the same scale. And when we do that, we can ask how much does it cost to um, generate a megawatt hour with onshore wind or with, I'm sorry, onshore wind if we have a subsidy. Solar, um, um, solar panels, utility scale or subsidized solar, okay? So these are relatively small subsidies. A lot of people say, well, hey, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be subsidizing these forms of energy next time, well, even later this time. Don't forget that we spend trillions of dollars a year to subsidize oil, gas, and coal. And I'll talk about that later, but nobody ever talks about that. Those subsidies are not calculated in here. Um, but when you look at the marginal cost of coal, nuclear, or gas, you can see that coal is actually more expensive than utility um, um, scale solar. Uh, and gas combined cycle, that's that most efficient one. You know, it's the renewables are still in the ballpark. So this is looking pretty good, in my opinion. Okay, we're making some progress toward a clean grid. Here's um, um, a table I pulled um, off the web from the um, Department of Energy. In 2020, Iowa generated over half of its power from wind. I mean, I live, used to live in Iowa. Let me tell you, the wind blows up there all the time. Um, and then the, you know, it goes down, down, down to other states. The total for the US is 8.3% of our power is generated with wind. That's not shabby, okay? Um, this was this is a graph from um, Inside Climate News, which is a very reputable um, um, organization about um, uh, energy, and um, they get their information from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. And in um, from January to March 2022, just this year, a lot of new onshore wind and utility scale solar went online, much more than the fossil fuels, and um, these, this is megawatts of power. This is how much power now we're getting from this. Um, and a, a reasonable amount of power generated from coal closed up. Natural gas, steam turbine closed up, et cetera. So we are trading this for this, which is good news. Now, only 3% of the nation's energy was generated by solar in 2020. But the Department of Energy has um, generated a big study called Solar Futures. Um, which includes grid decarbonization, that is getting rid of fossil fuels, going to wind and solar, and electrification, just what we've been talking about. And here's a link to that. So uh, I'll be sending out the slides and um, if everything goes as um, planned, the links will be hot so you can just get to these resources. Okay, where are we gonna put all that wind and solar? A lot of people argue about this. Where are we going to fit all that stuff? It turns out there is plenty of room, but local restrictions are multiplying even as we speak. And most of it is because people don't want their view changed. People don't want to look at a wind, at wind turbine. They, even if it's 20 miles offshore, this has been an ongoing issue in Ocean City, Maryland, where they have halted wind development offshore in Maryland for at least five or six years because they did not want to see tiny, tiny, tiny specks of red light out there at night for the, from the windmills 20 miles offshore. There's a lot of other natural, uh, not natural things you can look at in Ocean City that are to me more disturbing than those windmills, but that is my opinion. I'm just saying my opinion. Everybody's heard this phrase NIMBY, not in my backyard. People say, oh yeah, we need wind and solar, but I don't want you to put it over there. I don't wanna look at those solar panels. I don't wanna look at the wind mills. I don't want, you know, X, Y, Z. My opinion, that is not a sustainable point of view. We need to generate this power. When we do, everybody's gonna be better off. We're going to save a boatload of money. We're going to be healthier. It's going to be a really good thing. We have to get over not wanting the view. Okay. Uh, my opinion. Um, 
there is plenty of room for wind, um, even in the current case where you know everything is blue here. You can have you can have wind. Um, uh, in the case where access is limited by municipalities, there's still enough room calculated by um, Inside Climate News for 19 times what we have now. And this is just onshore wind. So there's plenty of room for wind. There's also plenty of room for solar. But again, you know, people don't want to look at it. Um, uh, here's a, a graph from, again, the Department of Energy. And this shows how much land in the US is devoted to certain things. 43% of land is devoted to agriculture. And it's very fitting that the cow is on here because 70% of all agricultural land is used to grow feed for animals. Disturbed areas, um, landfills and stuff suitable for solar, urban paved areas, which we, some of which we can get rid of, surface of the Great Lakes, um, don't laugh, I'm going to tell you about photovoltaics in a second. Here's how much surface area we need. It's smaller than all these things. Um, this is contaminated land like brownfields, old landfills, et cetera. We're not going to put land in yellow, panels in Yellowstone, don't worry, um, golf courses, et cetera. This is just for comparison. So this is really not very much. We, there have been numerous studies illustrating we have enough rooftop. We have enough other, you know, disturbed and brownfield areas, disturbed areas, brownfields, parking lots, rooftops. Goodness knows we got a lot of acreage in parking lots. Um, there's no shortage of places to put it. The problem with solar right now is that the solar developers want to put it up in the easiest and cheapest way possible. Well, hey, that makes sense, but it's a little short-sighted because if we, the easiest and cheapest place to put it up is in farmland. If we use farmland to put solar, it, it, I, the idea that you can grow crops around the solar panels really eh, not that, I, I don't know. It might be workable, but it's not immediately workable. And the solar developers have to spend more money if they, if they you know, have to go to a disturbed area, might, which might not be level or deal with brownfield parking lots. They have to put up a structure um, where, that someone might run into. But if you put solar panels on parking lots, everybody's car stays cool. It, you know, it reduces the urban heat island. There's a lot of benefits. So this is the kind of rocky beginning that we're in, you know, where people don't see the benefits, they only see the problems. This came out in Nature this last week. Um, I get this newsletter from Nature Magazine. Photovoltaics, solar panels floating on reservoirs, which apparently there's enough space in um, freshwater reservoirs across the country to put all the solar panels we need. There are some, you know, other, you know, downsides to that, but this this stuff is good idea. I like good ideas. Okay, get those good ideas out there. Okay, our power system needs to completely change the grid of the past, which basically we have now. You have these giant generating plants, gas, coal, etc. Then you have these big transmission lines that the power goes down. A lot gets lost as it goes to the substations, etc. And then it gets distributed to the various places that use it. It's all one-way transmission from these big plants. So it's all centralized. When the grid gets smart, and it's starting to get a little smarter all the time, it's not going to be so centralized because we're going to have a lot of sources of power. In addition to, we'll have these power plants for a while, or we'll have big solar arrays or big windmill farms that'll be more centralized and we'll have transmission lines and stuff. But we'll also in local areas have some solar generation, some windmills, we'll have batteries. Um, this is a generator, car, electric car that is essentially a big battery. And um, right now people are working on these microgrids which use sophisticated controllers <clears throat> to integrate the supply and demand. Okay, over all of these, um, uh, sources of places that need power. How much is needed now? Let's send it from here. Let's send it from there. Let's send it from somewhere else. The microgrid can detach itself from the big grid when there's a problem, which is good because, you know, when we have a hurricane blows through, the big grid goes down. PGE says, hey, well, sorry, you know, we'll get to you as soon as you can. If you're on microgrid and there's solar panels on people's houses and people have electric vehicles and there's utility scale solar, you just turn off from the big grid hey, we're just going to use the power we have here for the, for the moment. You can hook up to other microgrids. These controllers can also take into account the weather forecast and the markets to juggle the energy to make it the most efficient as possible. I love this. This is like so smart. So I can't wait for the grid to get smart because um, right now it's really dumb. Okay. 
already happening. New ideas for a new grid. I have to tell you, I love this. This is a Ford F-150 Lightning, that electric truck I told you about earlier. They, Ford has worked out a deal with um, Sunrun, a solar company, to install um, a what they call their Ford Intelligent Backup Power in your garage. The truck has a big enough battery to equal 9.3 Tesla power walls. Okay, it charges 131 kilowatt hours in the battery. You can plug that into your house, and let's say we've had a storm and, and the power's down. It looks nice there now, but the power's down. Your house runs from your truck. Okay, then the next day, if you have solar panels, your solar panels charge up your truck again. Whoa, how smart is that? I love that. So there have been various articles written about this, <clears throat> but the phrase I like the best is, you buy a battery backup for your whole home solar system, which you basically need to have if the grid's gonna go down. You buy a battery backup for your home solar system, you get a free truck. <laughs> I mean, what is not to love about that? Okay. I think that th these are the kinds of really smart ideas that we need to have. We never would have thought of even thinking about this. When I put the solar panels on my, on my roof, I never thought I'd be able to plug it in and charge a truck off of it or charge uh, run my house off the truck. This is a great idea. Okay, electrification benefits. Electrification saves money. This is information from re Rewiring America again, bringing infrastructure home report. Uh, I won't read all this, but just say almost all households are going to get cheaper energy bills. This is the percent of household saving. The darker the color, the more households save. Some states, not so much. Some states, more. Um, most households will save, this is across the U.S., an average of almost $500 a year. If we have everything in your house is electric, you have a, 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 an electric heat pump, et cetera, and we have a clean grid. Okay, so Average, actually, I'm not sure if this depends on a clean grid. I have to look that up, I'm sorry. But if it doesn't, it's really great. It still saves you almost $500 a year. Remember that charging your electric vehicle is still more efficient than putting gas into a regular vehicle. So everybody's gonna save a lot of money. Everybody is going to get health benefits. Um, I just read a report today from the National um, uh, Resources Defense Council and several other nonprofits called the cost of inaction and the burden of health. Um, it costs the US 800, over $800 billion a year in health um, expenses, people getting sick from air pollution. Air pollution is really deadly. I read an article about eight years ago um, outlining how not, about 900 people die in Baltimore every year from air pollution. We don't, we don't, we're like just thinking this is normal. You know, the air doesn't look that great. That's sort of normal. We don't need to have that. We'd save a lot of money and avoid a lot of personal suffering. Worldwide air pollution is the fourth biggest cause of death, huge global cause of death. And it also increases other heat um, health risks, all that other stuff you don't want. Um, uh, coronary disease, diabetes, blah, 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 et cetera. In 2019, more than 60,000 Americans died from air pollution, diseases um, that basically were triggered or caused by air pollution. This is huge, big health benefits, big equity benefits. If we look at the energy expenses of households in the highest, this is divided into 10, the highest 10th um, or the lowest 10th, you can see that as income levels go down, the percentage of household income spent on energy goes way up. These folks don't often, often have to decide, am I going to pay my electric bill or am I going to buy this medicine? Am I going to have to work a third job to pay my electric bill? And my kids won't you know, ha have to stay at home alone because I'll be working at this job. Energy expenditures are a big, big issue in lower income neighborhoods. When we clean things up, there'll be less air pollution in vulnerable neighborhoods. And we already know that they are taking the brunt of the gas and coal fire, fired power plants, the chemical plants, et cetera. There's so much more air pollution. If you look at neighborhoods in Baltimore, the neighborhoods by the power plants and incinerators are the ones that are less um, affluent than other neighborhoods. If they are saving, people are saving money on power, there's less conflict with other expenses like medicine. Maybe they won't have to have that third job. 
Um, both of these two things um, reduce, reduce health disparities. And I think possibly also educational disparities if parents aren't so stressed out and they have to have extra jobs and kids are staying alone, et cetera. So I would like to learn more about this and I plan to in the future, but I'm just giving this to you as a little temptation. How much is all this gonna cost and how are we gonna pay for it? It's a very good question. And I'm going to talk about the economics next time because when we talk about how much it costs to fix, we also have, have to talk about how much it costs not to fix, okay? And that's been one of the big problems. But from what I've read, I'll just say this, and I think that this is, you know, is, um, is true. We could cover almost, I'll hedge a little bit, the entire cost of a clean grid, um, the renewables and grid modifications with savings on healthcare and reduced subsidies for oil and gas. These are just two pictures from a International Monetary Fund report um, showing this is how much um, uh, Americans spend subsidizing oil and gas. This line is meant to be here. It's about well, it's about almost five hundred billion dollars a year. Okay, we spend on subsidies, right? If we didn't spend that, hey, that's a lot of money for windmills. If and um, uh, the reason that we are picking the tab up is because gas and oil have been artificially inexpensive, and they have not priced in the cost of the health problems, the pollution problems, et cetera. If they gave gas and oil, fossil fuels, a fair price, we would be on, this is CO2 emissions, we would be on this pathway right here. We would dramatically reduce CO2 emissions because people would not use as much oil and gas. Okay, this is called efficient fuel pricing. I'm not gonna talk about that anymore. I'm also going to talk next time on July 6th about how many hundreds of thousands of jobs will be created in the U.S. by electrifying and building out the grid. And these jobs cannot be sent off to China or wherever, okay, because it has to be done right here. Okay, I want to wrap up and I want to you know, put us you know, on a, 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 path, a, thinking, a thinking pattern for the end. To stop climate change and build a better world, we need to adjust our attitude, the way we think about many things. Um, we are all connected, all of the organisms, all of the humans in an interdependent biosphere, humans, all other organisms, microbes, plants, etc. Yet so often we think, the people who came to my biodiversity webinar last year seen these pictures. We think of humans at the top of the biodiversity heap. Somehow we're up here, we're separate from that. We don't need to worry about them, right? They're out there doing whatever it is they do. We don't have to worry about them, but we can't harvest them and use them for our own purposes, but we are not affected by them. That is not true, okay? And we are finding that to our peril right now. We cannot exist without that whole web of life. We are not separate from it and we are not above it. We are in it, okay? And what affects one element, this is funny, these are all vertebrates, oh, not all vertebrates, but you know, this is a very sort of depauperate picture of biodiversity, no plants, no insects, no microbes. But anyway, just visualize it for yourself. We are in there, we depend on them. We can't wreck it or otherwise we can't continue. And I want to point this out too. This is super important. This is not about saving the earth. We are not doing these things because we, want, we need to save the earth. The earth does not need us. The earth has been around for four and a half billion years. Okay. And life has evolved um, during that time. You know, I'm an evolutionary biologist, so I could really bore you with this, but I'm not going to. Life has been around for about four billion, three and a half billion years, okay? Humans have been around for 300,000 years. Like, whoa, the most recently evolved major species, humans, just came onto the planet 300,000 years ago into a whole biosphere populated by other species. What affects one um, species in this biosphere will eventually affect us all, and we're starting to learn that. Um, we are saving ourselves from the uninhabitable world we've made. We're not saving the earth. The earth is gonna go on without us. There have been five major extinctions already and 99% of all species that have ever been on earth are extinct. There is no reason to expect that humans cannot go extinct. Hey, we can totally go extinct. We are saving ourselves is what we're doing with this work. 
And, you know, I, I think it would be worth saving us, but we had, have to have a different attitude. We need this attitude. Okay, here's a little bit more about attitude. And anything with a red star comes from this book, which I highly recommend, The Future We Choose, The Stubborn Optimist Guide to the Climate Crisis by Christiana Figueres and Tom Rivet Karner. They are the architects, especially Christiana, architects of the Paris Climate Agreement. I listened to this as an audiobook, and it was incredibly inspirational. I can recommend it. I got it for free out of the Maryland Digital Library. Really worth it. We've got to let go of the old world. We can't say, I don't want my view interrupted. We can't say, I don't want fill in the blank. We cannot have the world we you know, dream about, we think we have. That world is disappearing rapidly. We cannot have that world. We cannot go back to the 1950s. We, it, it's not a possibility. We have to let it go. And Christiana Figueres says this very eloquently. She basically says, face the grief of having to let that go, but turn your face to the future and work for that. I am 100% on that. Um, humans have historically lived more cooperatively, okay? It's really only been a, a few hundred years where everyone lived individually, where we've had this sort of very extractive economy, where we didn't share, we had to have our own stuff, et cetera. Historically, humans have lived more cooperatively. And Figueres and Rivet Karnak talk about the need for cooperation, the, the power in sharing work, in sharing goals and sharing rewards, the social benefits of that, the economic benefits of that. Um, and I'll leave you to read that for yourself, but um, I think that's pretty important. They also say, see yourself as a citizen, get involved in civic engagement, get involved in your community, get involved with your neighbors, with if you have a faith community with them, see yourself as a citizen with responsibilities, not as a consumer defined by how much stuff you've got. Okay, so shopping mall doesn't mean you can never go to the mall, but this is not an identity that will serve us well in the future. They also say defend the truth and defend democracy. How important is that? We are seeing that every day. Um, and uh, and, and uh, I really you know, can't say more about how important that is to our future. Um, so we need a new attitude and it's gonna be hard, but we can totally do it. And it's going to be better than what we have right now. And I, I really believe that myself. And I'm hoping to provide evidence to you that that may be the case. I came across this letter to fellow citizens of Earth from scientists um, uh, as part of the Stockholm 50 report. This is a report 50 years after another group of 2000 scientists got together and talked about the state of the world. We must become good ancestors and better neighbors. They say we must shift to an economy of cooperation and sharing instead of competition, accumulation, and planned obsolescence. So if you think me saying, well, we need to do more cooperation and more you know, communal work, you know, a lot of people would say, Sarah, that's just airy fairy stuff. You know, it's like go live in a hippie commune. We're not talking about that. We are really talking about fundamentally recognizing how much better off we are if we cooperate than if we fight all the time. So I'll just close. We can totally do this. And I'm ready to start. I hope you're ready to start. So I've gone over my hour.